uh, uh, Thorn and Noid in absentia. So uh, for those that know Noid, Noid will not be able to make it. And uh, oh, it's Major. And it's going to be you're a little thin. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> for those that know Noid, please don't tell him I said that. Um, <laughs> Although I did encourage him that we're going to drink on his behalf, so afterwards we need to strap a couple on. So um, anyway, so these guys are going to talk uh, about uh, broomstick foo and that kind of thing. I wish I had. Oh, I do have an announcement. Um, oh, I do, I do. I was just up here rambling because I didn't think I had anything to say, but as it turns out. So I got the parking thing a little wrong when I told you the parking thing, okay? So you got to listen up, and I'm going to be wrong, and Hadi's going to tell me what's right. Um, if, if you're in a hotel and you parked a car, Okay, there's a group of people in that class, right? Okay, so yeah, at least one, thank you, sir. Um, and you want to take your car out, you have to go to the front desk and they give you a little swipey bit that you can use to get out of the, the parking garage. Um, and that will get you your $15 a day infinite in and out capability and all that kind of thing. If you want to just pull forward and back up and pull forward and back up, that, that will enable you to do that. Um, for everyone who drove here, you still have to come to our registration desk, not hotel registration, contract may have happened, come to our registration desk and we'll give you a little blue piece of paper that is impossible to duplicate and highly secure. So um, I guess that's it. You guys are going to go. Um, I'll give you 20-ish minutes. Damn it. Cool. Is Laz here? Laz was also joining us. Is he getting drunk somewhere else? Oh, well. Welcome. How are you? We're going to do a little bit different for the one-track mind. I'm going to try to through like real rapid fire about five minutes of slides. Kind of seed your brains with questions and we really want to hear what you want to know. So we're just going to give you a preliminary bit of detail and then it's all Q&A until we get thrown out of here. And then <clears throat> we'll probably either go to the Lockpick Village or up to the bar. Keep buying us drinks and we'll keep answering your questions the rest of the night. A quick word about my panelists here. Major Malfunction, who was not listed but has very graciously come with us is a very, very enthusiastic firearm owner and shooter. Thorn, as you can see in your program, is former law enforcement, excellent, excellent source of knowledge of law and things like that. Laz, you coming? Come on up, Laz. That doesn't matter. You got a table. Everyone applaud for Laz. Laz is another physical security expert who I've met around, done locks with, done trigger time with. Let's get rolling. Start with a quick show of hands, anyone who's comfortable saying so. How many people here are gun owners? All right, all right. How many people shoot regularly? Probably most of those same hands. A little bit less, though. How many people have ever used a firearm defensively? Either fired or even just had to brandish? All right, not too many hands. And lastly, how many people are considering a purchase, either of a, a new gun or maybe your first gun? A lot of hands, excellent. This will pertain lot probably to that last category, but everyone should get something out of this. What this talk is about, it's defensive firearm ownership and use. We're not talking about storming, you know, assaulting another facility, we're just talking about protecting yourself the best way you can. We're talking about everything within the law, hardware speaking, so don't ask us about full auto mods. We're talking about keeping yourselves within the law, so everything legal, licensed, we can try to talk to you about permits if you want to know that. Before we start, it would be remiss if we didn't quickly hit what are the four laws of firearm safety. Always, you always treat a weapon as though it is loaded. You never point in a direction you wouldn't want to fire. You're always aware of your target and what is beyond it. A lot of people miss that one, get into trouble that way. And lastly, your finger stays off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. So here we have Michael Douglas, <clears throat> and he's publicly brandishing a illegally modified fully automatic Infratech in a fast food restaurant because they stopped breakfast. So what rules is he breaking specifically? What can you see? Finger on the trigger. And as anyone who's seen the film knows, he puts a few rounds through the ceiling in a second. Almost every foul up I've ever seen with someone using a gun, their finger was on the trigger when it had no purpose being there. Why choose to own guns? I like to just address very fast. It's not about bad neighborhoods. It's, you may probably get this question if you're a gun owner and your friends aren't. It's not about that. It's just about preparing for what horrible things may come along. The worst that you can't think of can get really bad, really fast, without anyone knowing it was going to happen. Also, people will tell you with a gun ownership, often the, the places where you can't own guns have some of the worst crime rates. 
ask major malfunction about things across the pond over in Britain. Now again, correlation is not causation, but it's an important fact. What we're going to discuss, weapon selection, ammo selection, <clears throat> keeping trained, some psychological considerations, and then knowing the law. About weapons, really fast. Three basic types of weapons most people would already know. Rifles, shotguns, handguns. If you're looking to defend your home and your property, rifles are basically off the list. If you're a hunter, you know, yeah, you have a rifle in the house, you could use it. But if you're considering an investment, you really don't need a rifle unless you're defending a huge patch of land from a platoon of hostiles advancing on you. <laughs> shotguns and handguns. It really boils down to shotguns and handguns. We'll give you some details on each. Shotguns. Three major shotgun for anyone who doesn't know. Pump action is probably the kind you've seen many times. There are auto-loading shotguns, however. And also, don't discount old style. You know, little side-by-side, -side, double barrel. A lot of, lot of benefit. You could have something like that, a little get-off-my-porch kind of gun. <laughs> it is hard to top a really nice pump action, I will admit. There's a soft spot in my heart for them. Everyone always asks me, if I don't own a single gun, but I just want one thing, and I give them the same answer. Go out and get a Remington 870 or get a Mossberg 500 series. You can ask why those are so good. In general, though, there's a lot of versatility that a shotgun will offer you. If you're going to buy just one thing, consider a simple pump-action shotgun. You can put a lot of rounds in it. You can do a lot of fancy things with how you load it. You can have it ready very quickly. The old style of shotgun, I will point this out, a regular pump-action shotgun, you can't just load and keep in a closet forever. Because over time, you will have springs that can deform. You can have Remember, shot shells are plastic. Those will deform over time. You want to cycle those out if you're keeping a pump shotgun loaded. If you, however, have an old double barrel, especially one with exposed hammers, you drop your shells in that, lock it, and bring the hammers back down, you have a weapon that's not under any stress whatsoever. No springs are under tension. You can leave that in a stored position safely for as long as you want to. And of course, you can accessorize the heck out of most shotguns. Handguns. How many people understand the difference between a pistol and a revolver? in this room. For anyone who doesn't, there's, there's, you know, it's pretty straightforward here. A revolver has a rotating cylinder, which puts rounds ready to be fired. An auto loader, the slide racks back each time you fire it, puts a, chain, a round in the chamber. There's benefits and there's pros and cons to each. Don't just think one is better. You know, the old cop movies where the rookie, you know, he, he's the young kid and he's got the automatic and his partner's old school with the old revolver that no one carries anymore. No, people carry revolvers. They're very good for a lot of reasons. Revolvers are simple. Very reliable. You're not going to see a jam with a revolver. If you're just starting out shooting, consider starting with a revolver. Like I said about the old style shotgun, again, a revolver. You can keep loaded, with no spring pressure, keep that in a drawer forever. I don't recommend that. I recommend you go shoot once in a while. <laughs> so you don't want to just keep something in your drawer and never be ready. Pistols, yes, you're going to have more rounds, faster reloads. You could jam, you could foul, and you have to cycle out that magazine if you're keeping it around, loaded all the time. No matter what you choose, make sure you maintain it. Make clean properly, get your smithing done by the right people. I've had things damaged, or I know people who've really had things damaged because they try to do it themselves. Ammunition. Storage. 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 Yes, well, Moo mentioned, yes, proper storage just means securely store it. Know where you've stored it. Keep it dry. Keep it, you know, don't let it corrode. There's nothing sadder, really, is there, than seeing a gun that someone just has mistreated. Green. It's, yeah, it's, oh, it's, a, it's awful. <coughs> with ammo, you should know with a handgun, going to look for anything smaller than a 9mm or a 38. If you do, you're really not going to bring someone down if you have to. I'm a 45 shooter. A lot of my friends are. Anything over that, you're getting a little silly. You don't need a 454 Casul or a Smith & Wesson 500. Yes, you do. <laughs> they are fun, though, aren't they? They're a blast. If you've never fired a 500, I highly recommend it. Go over the 440 grain full magnum rounds. <clears throat> for shotguns... Yeah. For shotguns, I could tell you all about different gauge sizes, and we could, you know, oh, the 20 gauge versus the... We're not going to get into that. Just get a friggin' 12 gauge. The ammo is everywhere. There's all kind of ammo for it. It's a lot easier. It's very universal. What we want you to ask us more about later, get into detail about this, is preventing overpenetration. If you take away no other fact, take this fact away. When you shoot at someone, if God forbid you have to, and you miss them, or even if you hit them, depending on what you're shooting, there's a very real chance that your round is going to keep on going a lot farther than you intended. Look into hollow points into frangible ammo. If you're protecting your home and your property with a shotgun, do not load it with slugs. Load it with shot shell. 
You don't even need double O buck. You can use single O or even number one buck has some of the best crush cavity. We're going to have to wait, wait, but hold the question. We want questions. Question also, ask us if you want about less than lethal ammo. Another reason I love my Mossberg pump shotgun. My home defense setup is I load it full of number one shot buck and I top the tube off with two less than lethal rounds, just hard rubber buckshot. If I have to, I can cycle through two non-lethal rounds and if someone is still behaving very improperly in my home, I know that there's a very serious situation and I have no qualms about cycling through the rest of that tube. Don't just leave your gun laying around if you get one. Go out, try to use it, try to practice with it, train as much as you can. How often does everyone here shoot, would you say? Weekly. Weekly? Thorn? Monthly. Monthly? Laz? I mean, weekly? Yeah, get out there. I shoot or more often when I can because it's, it's fun, as anyone will tell you. You get the repetition going. You get muscle memory built up. You will only be as good as your own predictability is. You'll learn how the weapon handles. Take a defensive shooting course if you can, or if you can't do that, see if your local range allows you to do some more exotic things, drawing from a holster and back, rapid firing, rapid tactical reloading. Would be remiss if we didn't mention there are certain psychological considerations that you have to think about before you leap right into this. Can you actually take someone's life if it came down to it? I actually have people who are very dear to me, and I respect and love them, but they've said, you know, I, never, I could just never do that. If someone, you know, like what if a guy came at you with a knife and an affidavit signed that says, I am here to rape and kill you? Uh, no, I, I still just, I couldn't do that. It's just my time, I guess. And I said, well, be prepared living with me. I'm going to be shooting the friggin' guy, so that's going to be on your conscience. <laughs> of course, a concealed carry permit will up the ante a lot. There's an aftermath like a lot of to, you know, ask about, ask some of the people who've actually been in these situations about what you go through afterwards as well. Very quickly, legal notes, it really boils down to follow the law. Know the law and follow it. A lot of us with the libertarian mindset like to say, oh, you know, some laws are just dumb and, you know, you can just flaunt your way through, like, dumb laws. A lot of people I know treat, you know, certain drug and drinking laws like that. They say, well, it's just patriotic to ignore the stupid laws. You know, I have a certain respect for that kind of flagrant, you know, don't, don't fuck around with gun laws. Not only can you be prosecuted and incarcerated, you can lose not just the gun involved if you were carrying it where you shouldn't be. You could lose your rights to all guns. You could really be stripped of a lot of freedoms that you should have because they're already dwindling enough. Please ask Thorne or anyone else who might have knowledge of how to behave during and especially after a shooting. The police are not going to arrive on the scene fully appraised of what has happened. There are certain considerations, certain behaviors that you should have done before there so that they don't rush on you, weapons drawn, and make a bad situation a lot worse. Again, one more time, let's hear it out loud. What is the first rule of firearm safety? A firearm is always loaded. What is the second rule about pointing the gun? You never point it where you wouldn't want it to fire. What is the third rule? That's the fourth rule. What is the third rule about your target? And what is beyond it, exactly, that's what I wanted to hear. And someone said the fourth rule already off the trigger. That is, that is the slides. That is all I've got. It's all Q&A from here on out. Thank you. We should have some crowd mics. If we have crowd mics, try to use them. If not, we'll repeat your question. This gentleman had his hand up early. Yeah, the gentleman points out the gentleman points out the length sure. of the barrel will be sure. a, a large consideration. Uh, he was really just kind of making a point, not so much asking a question, but it's a good point to raise. How a weapon will handle varies a lot, so that's a consideration if you're trying to carry something small versus manage a very large recoil. Especially if you're going to buy one, ranges love for you to shoot a lot of their sample weapons. They've got a whole display case full of stuff they're trying to sell you. Usually it's going to be overpriced. You don't have to tell them you're buying somewhere else, but you know, shoot every one of the guns that, that your local range has on display. Find out what you like. There, I'd like. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, you heard most of what I said, I think. So, if you could follow up on that, please. Thanks. Basically, if, if you're going to be involved in a shooting situation, um, you can almost be assured that the police will arrive and be pointing the weapons at you and anybody else that's armed. Now, you may have already taken someone out; they may be down. But if you're, what you're going to do is kind of back off and expect that the cops are going to order you down. You will be handcuffed. 
You'll be interrogated as to what happened immediately. Um, you'll probably be arrested depending upon the jurisdiction and, and what laws may have been broken. But they're probably going to assume that you're in the middle of a homicide situation uh, and you are the bad guy until you can get things explained. Now, the other thing that you should probably do is, aside from saying something like, I was in fear for my life, I had to take you should immediately request an attorney and consult with the attorney before making any other statements. Um, I can't stress that enough. People can talk themselves right into something that was maybe a homicide charge uh, or maybe a manslaughter charge right into a homicide charge without any difficulty whatsoever. So consult an attorney first before you make any other statements. No, that's a good point. Uh, asking attorney does not imply guilt. What you're doing is protecting your own rights under the situation. Uh, I wouldn't say that under any circumstances. Uh, the, uh, the, the comment was you should drag the bad guy back into the premises. Um, <laughs> while I can understand a certain amount of uh, uh, feeling towards that, it's not necessarily a good idea. Modifying a crime scene, and it is a crime scene, uh, under any circumstances is you in deeper water. The, the Castle Doctrine basically says uh, that you can defend your home as its castle, as a castle. Um, it depends on the state. That's one of those things that is all over the place. Some places maintain that if you have uh, your home being broken into under any circumstances, you can use deadly force. Uh, other places, not so much. And that really it can vary even according to the cities. So, another question. Major, do you want to tell a quick story about how things are? <laughs> I got one over here. Pond, okay, speaking about um, castles, in the UK we're actually not allowed to have uh, weapons purely for defensive purposes, uh, but we are allowed to use reasonable force. So if I happen to be cleaning my shotgun at the time someone comes barging through the door, then reasonably use it if I'm in fear for my life. But if if they thought that gun was there for the purpose of shooting the guy, then I would be in trouble. So, How often do you cycle your mags? About once a month, if you're storing. The question was, if you're storing uh, mags, if you're storing ready, how often do you cycle them? I, I cycle once a month. I would recommend that. Does anyone else store or carry ready or anything like that? Uh, yeah. One thing you really want to be aware of, and he asked a simple question of how often you cycle mags, which needs to add in, are you using stock mags or are you buying quality? Mm -hmm. uh, magazines are, are one of the most important parts of any weapon. Buy quality mags if you get some aftermarket magazines designed specifically for personal defense. Uh, you still need to cycle them, but if you're just using factory mags, you, you're, you're not as safe. Um, cycle them often. There's no reason not to. I personally, every night before I go to sleep, cycle my mag just because it's, it's my habit. It makes me comfortable with my gun. Um, well, that's just... Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, what, what, but gun, guns are not bad, but. And also, it's, in, we could point out, you know, the more mags you have, the more downtime a lot of them will have. If you have two mags and you're switching them weekly or monthly, that's fit half the time on, half the time off stress. If you have 12, you know, you should always have a lot of mags. They're just great. Well, one um, thing you, you also know. have to be aware of with magazines and springs, and some people in here probably know a lot more about physics than I do, uh, it's my understanding that springs and magazines will not wear out as quickly are put in and left in it as much as if you cycle them constantly and the springs are expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting. You actually wear out your magazines quicker uh, by cycling as much as I do, but I'm an ass. Um, <laughs> but just, just be, be aware of that because some people do shoot constantly. You're going to have to replace your magazines more than if you just have something put away. The, the fear often is if you leave something compressed for so long, the spring will wear out. While that is true, it'll wear out even faster if you're cycling it constantly. Mm -hmm. There was one hand in here. After the issue's over. What's that again? There was a hand down here. Yeah, I had a question about, oh, let me not get feedback. Um, the definition of good training for something like the defensive techniques that you were talking about beyond just the basics that you were putting up there, your basic NRA class, what would be a description of good training or where would you go to look for something like that? Well, I think you kind of, at least in my opinion, hit it on the head. Uh, any NRA recognized class for defensive shooting would be uh, where I would start. There, there's a couple of things out there. One is called IDPA, International Pistol Association. 
Uh, they go through a lot of courses. I've done a bunch of their basic defense courses where you go through rather than this is the gun, this is the end, the bullets come out, how to draw, how to draw quickly, how to keep your balance and all those things. IDPA is something that's very important. Uh, it's meant as a sport, but it is all practical shooting, nothing based on target or slow. It's all quick draw stuff. Uh, there's also a number of schools. There's uh, Crucible down in Virginia. Oh, we're in, no, we're in D.C. But Crucible in Virginia just across the water. There's a bunch of other schools where you can go for training. But practice, no matter how many you take if you don't practice often there's no point question was holsters for concealed carry uh, someone who's been on the job maybe <laughs> I, I like a pancake or a shoulder holster um, depends on what you're doing where you're going to be and so forth uh, mode of dress changes that um, if you you have to really consider that obviously you can't dress in jeans and a t-shirt if you're going to wear a pancake unless it's an oversized t-shirt or um, you know like a Hawaiian shirt or something like that you just can't do it um, you know business suit you can get away with a lot so but I generally I like a pancake um, when I was on the job as a detective I used to wear a shoulder holster um, aside from the fact that you know look like a detective uh, <laughs> it, it actually is a very comfortable carry it's not the best to draw from you get in a shooting situation you get a cross draw and it's not the best so just a pancake usually the best thing I like same gun same place all the time is by far one of the biggest defensive things I, I instinctually it's almost funny when I'm not carrying any kind of firearm on me when I get nervous my hand just goes here it's it's become instinctual uh, when you can slap and draw it becomes normal gun is in a shoulder holster because I have shoulder holsters also which I love they really look cool with them um, <laughs> but uh, I, the only time I would ever wear a shoulder holster only time I have ever is where I'm in a vehicle for a long time I need something I can draw from sitting and I can't get to my holster because it's behind my seatbelt or something only time I ever do although they really do look cool but uh, same gun same place all the time if you have 10 different guns uh, and you're trying to carry each one to see which is the most comfortable do it in your house uh, do it in a comfortable situation don't try a new gun when you're going somewhere uncomfortable in the back a question or are you tell me time okay one question uh, here and then you he's could been you patient. just get uh, all of your opinions um, and your use if any of trigger locks gun safes and as a third question any special considerations for firearms in the home where young children might be present um, all right just down the line uh, I like gun safes more than just trigger locks because in general the tool folk will all tell you trigger locks are just crap um, the, the question about home where, where children are, I believe more than anything else, and I've said this in unrelated talks, that you never hide guns or any technolo technology or any private thing from a child, because curiosity will definitely kill the cat and maybe his you know, next door neighbor. Um, teach your kids about guns, teach them to respect them, teach, you know, take them to fire, shoot a watermelon or something in someone's backyard and say, look at the actual damaging capacity this could have. Make sure they understand them, and that's more than battle right there but I don't believe like a hundred percent you know I was taught from a young age but my dad still had a little locking gun case something that you know you're just deterring them from from really from really getting in there something that's good enough that they can't just instantly get past it ask us in the hardware booth over there about which ones really suck and then buy a different one I uh, I don't like trigger locks at all I, I think they're basically useless um, gun safes are good uh, as far as having a firearm um, with kids around, yeah, you got to tell the kids that it's there. It, otherwise, it, it's just not realistic. You're trying to hide something from them. Um, it, it doesn't really work. Uh, one thing, you know, I'll pass this out too. If you're going to use something for a defensive uh, weapon in the house and you've got kids, you're really concerned about it, um, one of the best things, it, it also works if you don't like the idea of taking someone else's life, pepper spray. It takes a fight out of people like you would not believe. Um, and, you know, if you happen to spray the kids coming in at 3 a.m. because they snuck out or something, uh, <laughs> the worst that's going to happen is you're going to have to wash them, their faces for 20 minutes. Uh, it, it's really a good, good uh, defensive weapon uh, without the danger of, of lethality. Uh, well, in the U.K., we actually don't have any choice. We have to store... If the firearm's not in use, it has to be locked in a gun cabinet. Um, the gun cabinet 
to have been inspected by your local firearms officer, he will actually come to your house and check that he's happy with where it is, that it's secure, um, and I actually have to store my ammunition separately. And in the case of a rifle, I have to store the bolt separately from the rifle, separately from the ammunition. So, so I thought I, New Jersey was bad. I clean my gun a lot. Say again? I thought New Jersey was bad. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I tend to be cleaning my gun quite a lot and have all the components there. So. Uh, I'm kind of weird that way. When it comes to kids, and I'll get to that at the end, uh, when, when I was in New Jersey, or I, I live in New Jersey, and when I moved to a new town, I had to interview with the chief in order to get my new permits for that new town. And the chief spent a considerable amount of time on how do you have it locked, do you have a vault, do you have a safe, do you have, what, do you have trigger locks, what do you have? And I told him I have a, a pretty secure location for most of my guns, but not the ones that I keep loaded and ready. The other ones are locked away in a safe, no one's getting to them. Uh, but I do keep some loaded and ready, and he gave me at least our speech about how I'm irresponsible and I'm a terrible person and guns should be kept locked all the time and uh, well I keep my gun ready I don't have any kids in the house as a burglar you're gonna have to really work to find them and I know where they all are uh, that's one thing number two as far as kids in the house I think probably I was about two years old the first time I handled a firearm I didn't fire one until I was about eight but my dad would open up the gun closet and say okay get the guns you know the rules and what are the and we go through it, and I can handle pretty much any firearm I've ever held safely. I've never had an accident. I've, well, I, I closed the slide on my thumb once, but that doesn't count. Uh, but I've never had a gun accident. I've seen gun accidents, and I've never seen one with a child. I've seen them with adults. Recently with Brian. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Uh, yeah, we'll so, tell you about it. Yeah. Ask us later about the guy at our range. That's, but I, I really don't have a good response for it with children. Uh, I do believe in locking up guns. I do believe in keeping guns ready. I don't have kids. I don't know my kids. If I Kids, I would know whether to trust where I would maybe keep it on a high shelf or with my kids I'd probably have them trained well enough that from the time they're five years old they can pick that gun up and defend the home but I don't have kids so I really can't speak on that all right we're gonna get your your final question and then all the rest come hang out in the hardware area you touched on this briefly but uh, what's your feeling on competition as it relates to to uh, readiness be it IDPA or IPSC or what have you I have no useful answer in competitions like that anyone else I always lose. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, the rest of the time, thank you very much. We'll be around. Find us. Talk to us. It was a pleasure. All right. So um, we got one more One Track Mind talk, and then uh, we'll have our keynote at 7 o'clock. So I think we'll have another stand-up session there right before 7, just to give everybody a chance to stretch. Um,